Testament, we know that the, the Jewish people were divided into two nations at times. One of those nations was Israel, and one of those nations was Judah. They were all Jewish people. They were all brothers and sisters. It's kind of like the United States was at one point. You had the North, and you had the South. You had the Union, you had the Confederacy. It was the same way. And then there were civil wars over there between Judah and Israel, and they fought against each other just exactly like happened here in the 1860s, all right, the early 1860s. So it's no different then than it was early days of this country, um, brothers and sisters fighting against each other. Now, 
It just so happened in the book of Isaiah that we find that there was a king named Ahaz, A-H-A-Z, Ahaz. And Ahaz was the king of Judah, not Israel, but of Judah at that time. King David started off as the king of Judah, and later they merged and he became the king of Israel when they become one nation uh, together. But Ahaz was a king who constantly lived in fear that the Israelites were going to come and invade or the Philistines were going to come and invade or the whatever was going to come and invade and take the land, take the houses, uh, take the spoil, kill them all, the people in Judah. And he was, there was a great battle of Bruin and they had gathered together to do battle against the, uh, uh, the inhabitants of Judah at that time. And Ahaz was afraid, so God told Isaiah, I want you to go and speak to Ahaz, and I want you to let him know that this battle will not take place. I'm going to stop this battle. Yes, they're gathering. They're going to, uh, they think they're going to come and invade. They think they're going to overrun you, but it's never going to happen. So stop worrying. Stop stressing out. Stop fearing. Any of you ever stress out over things that never come about? If you're thinking no, you're lying right now. Because we all stress out over things, and we worry about things that never happen. We conjure them up in our mind, and we think of worst-case scenario. We think everything is going to fall to pieces because there's this black cloud that lives over me. And you live in that constant mindset, and it never happens. You know what you've done? You've wasted precious time. You've wasted precious time on stress and worry. My, my granddaddy used to tell me, because I've always been a talker. I've always liked to talk. Um, I haven't always liked to be up in, in front of the church. As a matter of fact, there was a time in my life that I would not. But I used to talk my granddaddy's ears off, and he, and he would say, Boy, can you just be quiet for a few minutes? Can you just stop talking for a few minutes? And I'd say, Yes. And then I'd start talking again. And he said, There, you just did it. I said, What? He said, you just wasted two minutes of your life. At the end of your life, you're going to need that breath back, boy. And I mean, he constantly was telling me that. In other words, why don't you just be quiet? But that wasn't in my nature. So what we find is uh, uh, Ahaz stressing out and worrying and wasting his time on stress. And God told Isaiah, he said, go tell Ahaz not to worry about this. Go tell him to chill out. I got this, and just tell Ahaz to ask me for a sign, and I'm going to confirm to him that I am God and I got this under control. So Isaiah went to Ahaz and said, hey, God said he's got it. Ask him for a sign, and he'll show you something. And Ahaz is like, I am not testing God. I am not. That would be against everything. Now, let me tell you this. It is never wrong I want you to listen to me because I'm fixing to rock some of your theology. It is never wrong to question God when you need clarity. It is never wrong to question God when you need clarity. When you feel like he's leading you in a particular direction, I advise you, spread the fleece out and see what God does with it. Now, some of you are looking at me, what do you mean spread out the fleece? There again, another good old Old Testament story. There's a man named Gideon, and God went to him. Gideon was shy. God, uh, uh, Gideon was kind of uh, reserved. He was afraid. He was kind of fearful. And Gideon was over, and he was stepping on, and he was threshing wheat. How about that? And he's at the threshing floor, and he's stomping out the wheat, separating the wheat from the chaff. And uh, an angel of the Lord most theologians, and I personally do too, not that I'm a theologian, but they believe that that angel that showed up was Jesus in, in Old Testament form, showed up and said, hey, I'm addressing you, you mighty warrior. Now, here's a guy hiding, stomping on wheat, and he goes, you talking to me? Mighty warrior? I'm a coward, man. I'm hiding. What do you mean, mighty warrior? The angel told him, he said, you're going to be the leader of a great army who's going to be very victorious. And he's like, not a chance. He said, I'm, and I'm carrying on the conversation here. The angel said, yes, it is. God said it's going to happen. So Gideon said, okay, well, if this is really what God wants me to do, 
What I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to take my fleece, a.k.a. we know it as a rug. I'm going to take my fleece and I'm going to put it out on the ground. And if God really is going to do this with me, then he's going to put dew. He's going to wet my rug and everything else is going to be dry. So dew will only fall on my rug if this is what God wants. So he put that rug out there that night and he woke up the next morning going outside. And sure enough, everything is dry as a bone. But his fleece, his rug was dripping wet. So he's like, oh, man. I'm still not sure if this is what God wants or not. Well, we do the same thing. We'll question God for six months trying to get out of it. So he said, okay, so tonight I'm going to put my fleece back out there. And tomorrow morning, if the fleece, if my rug is dry and everything else is wet, then I know this is what God wants. Now, in the ministry, we call that you're testing God to see if he's going to see things your way. Uh -huh. Some of you do that. You pray, oh God, my will be done, not yours. God, I, I want you to do it this way. And until you do it this way, I'm going to be rebellious. And I'm going to keep on praying that you'll do it this way. Darn well, no. I'm sorry, I just said that. I was ready to turn south Louisiana, by the way. <laughs> Knowing good and well. That God's already told you what it is you're supposed to do. But you want him to change his mind. That's what Gideon was trying to do. So he put that fleece out. He went out the next morning. Everything's saturated like a Hurricane Katrina rain. And his rug was dry as a bone. So then Gideon knew. We call that laying out a fleece. All right? So Ahaz is kind of laying out a fleece going, I am not going to test God. I'm going to sit here in my worry. I'm going to fret over this army that's gathering against us. I don't know that I can believe God, but I'm not going to test him. God told Isaiah, he said, well, you just go back and tell Ahaz this. I'm going to send him a sign anyway. Whether he wants it or not, I'm sending it to him. And here is the sign that he sent to Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7, beginning or with verse 14. Here it goes. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, let me ask you this. When it comes to signs from heaven, what more notable sign could a person get than a young teenage girl who is a virgin who has never had sexual relations with anybody all of a sudden getting pregnant. That's a pretty big sign. That's a God-sized thing. Amen? I've heard stories of girls telling their parents that they were virgins and they didn't know how they got pregnant. I literally, I was a youth pastor for many years. I've heard everything you can throw at me. Don't ever try to lie to me because I know you. This sign was a God-sized sign. That's what was prophesied in Isaiah. Okay? Now, before you go and study Ahaz, and I hope you will, just to get a little more background, Ahaz was not a good king. He led the people of Judah into idolatry. He was a rebellious guy. He, he just he wasn't a good king. Okay? His daddy was. His son was. He stuck right in the middle. He was a bad guy. All right? And he wasn't king a terribly long time, but the damage he did to Judah uh, was heavy. But in this particular battle, in this particular time, God, uh, uh, God spared him. But that didn't stop the nation from paying some pretty deep consequences. All right? I want to give it to you this way so that you'll understand. When you read the Old Testament, you find that nations rise and fall based on leadership. In 2023, nations rise and fall based on leadership. Companies rise and fall based on leadership. Are you with me on that? It's always been that way, and it always will be that way. When people are throwing 
uh, throwing all kind of smear campaigns and blaming it on this and blaming it on this and blaming it on this and blaming it on this. I want to give you a really fast news flash and then we're moving on. Everybody is at fault in Washington, D.C. Everybody. Don't blame one, it's everybody's fault. Then it falls back to us for letting it happen. Enough of that. Let's move on. Now we're going to come to Isaiah chapter 9. The problem that Judah was having, they were experiencing war, and God told them, this is not going to last forever. It's not going to be this way forever. But right now, you're in a really bad situation, but there's coming a time it will ease off. Now we slide to Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse number 1. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. Now, this particular prophecy here in Isaiah chapter 9, obviously, when God told Isaiah to write it, it had not yet happened. It was future all of it was future. Now, in 2023, we can look back. Several of those prophecies have, in fact, been fulfilled. Several of them are still yet to be fulfilled. Okay, so it wasn't a prophecy that covered a 10-year span. It's a prophecy that has covered, so far, 2,000 years and however long it takes to complete these prophecies. So here we go, the second half of verse number 1. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future, remember this was written 700 years before Christ, there is a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. Now that was a prophecy because when Isaiah wrote it, the Galileans were not, they were kind of detestable people. All right, everybody was kind of prejudice toward them. That's just the way it was. Matter of fact, if you think back into the New Testament, they were talking about Jesus, and one of the guys said, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, Nazareth is in Galilee. So it wasn't a very respected thing. But what the prophecy of Isaiah said, there's coming a time where it will be filled with glory. You know where Jesus came from? Don't tell me Bethlehem. That's just where he was born. Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. All right? So the only reason Jesus was born in Bethlehem is because he was of the lineage of David, and death of Bethlehem is the house of David. And so he went back there. You might say, no, Joseph was there. Uh, let me tell you something. That might be how he got there. But that was God's plan that Jesus born in Bethlehem. But he was raised in Nazareth, Galilee. So that glory did actually and will and is currently. Uh, look, I, how many of you ever toured Israel? Any of you ever toured Israel? I'm going to tell you that just a couple of us in here. I loved being down in the region in the Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is there. And I loved being there because as I'm walking down the road, seeing the sea, walking on the, on the sands of the sea. Now, we think of Sea of Galilee it's probably small. Matter of fact, I know it's smaller than Lake Pontchartrain, but it's actually called the Sea of Galilee. Go figure. Um, but as I'm walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, I'm thinking, man, Jesus probably walked here as a child. To think that, I'm going, oh my gosh. You know, walking up a road or a trail that you know that trail's old. You're thinking, man, maybe Jesus walked on this trail when he was a, a boy. When you go over uh, into Capernaum and when those other places and you know what happened there, it's like, oh my gosh, I love being up there. I love being in the whole country, but up there was just special because it was filled with glory for me. My mind is just, ah. Uh. So that's part of that prophecy. Verse number two, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Jesus is the light that shone in the darkness. He was the fulfillment of that prophecy. You will enlarge the nation of Israel. This is still yet to happen. 
You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. This is all yet to happen, but it is coming. Jesus will one day step his foot. You go read Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation. Jesus will one day step his foot back from heaven on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is going to split wide open, and Jesus will establish his kingdom on the throne of David in Jerusalem. It's coming. We call it the Millennial Kingdom of Christ. It happens at the Battle of Armageddon. It institutes then. And then he will reign from David's throne forever and ever according to what says the word. That prophecy is yet to come, but it's coming. It's coming, right? Verse number 6. Here we go. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, The government will rest on his shoulders. During that millennial kingdom, it absolutely will. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That was the prophecy that Isaiah wrote. And that prophecy was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. The problem was the Jewish nation did not recognize Jesus. They didn't recognize the Messiah when he came. The prophecy was fulfilled, but they didn't accept it. Look, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. I am so thankful that there was a day some uh, almost 38 years ago, 39 years ago now, when Jesus was seeking to save me. I ran from him, and I ran from him. I wasn't looking for him, but I finally slowed down enough for him to get me. And when he got me, he rocked my world. He turned me inside out. He changed every part of me. I was never the same from that moment on. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. But thank God I'm not what I was. Because I was happy in what I was. I was happy as a drunk. I was happy as a thief. I was happy as a fornicator. I was happy as a liar. I was happy as a violent fighter. That's who I was. And I was perfectly happy in that. That was my identity and I loved it. But oh, when Jesus came by, everything changed. And there's nothing back there that would draw me back any longer. There's nothing back there for me. My happiness is based on the joy of the Lord, not on the joy of what I want to do. Because my flesh is ugly. Is your flesh ugly? I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about your your bent to sinning. We like to sin. We like our sin. We like our drunkenness. We like our drug abuse. We like our sexual immoralities. We like our anger. We like our depression. We like our everything. We like it because that's who we are, and that's where we find our, de- our identity in. But let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ comes in, he changes everything. He'll make a brand new you, a brand new you, and you can't do anything but follow him or be miserable. So if you're miserable, maybe it's because you aren't following. Amen and amen. Amen. Woo! Good preaching there, preacher. (laughs) Look, the long-awaited child, Jesus, finally made his appearance. What a wonderful, wonderful day that was. We look back. You know what? I would imagine if we were there, it would have just been another day for us. It would have just been another day. Oh, yeah, some... Young couple just had a baby over in a cattle stall. Poor people didn't even have enough money. Surprised they didn't have a sign standing out on the road, we'll work for food. That's what we would have thought because there was nothing extraordinary about them. You know, we see these stories where 
Mary's riding into Bethlehem on a donkey with a halo over her head. We see those pictures. She was an ordinary teenage girl. She looked ordinary. She just happened to be chosen by an extraordinary God to do an extraordinary thing. That's who Mary was. And Joseph, he was just an ordinary dude, engaged to Mary. Now, the engagement back then was a legal process, kind of like the engagement then was almost like marriage now. The difference was they were engaged, they were legally bound, but they had not yet consummated the marriage. So it wasn't considered a full marriage until the honeymoon night when it was consummated. And I'm not going any deeper than that. You can splanify that to your kids. Okay? But that's, that's the way it was. So here we pick up in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 18. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now let me stop there for a minute. I want to paint you a picture that you fully understand. Here is Joseph, and here is Mary. Joseph probably was early 20s, Mary anywhere from 15 to 18, okay? Marrying age then, that's the way it was. Joseph had not touched Mary. He was a man of character, he was a man of integrity, and he's a man who loved God. Joseph said, I am not having premarital sex with this woman, with this girl. Mary, a righteous woman, young lady, said, I am not having sexual relations until I consummate my marriage. So I will remain a virgin until the day that I get married. By the way, uh, that's God's plan. That's God's plan. Man done messed that all up. And some of you are thinking it's okay to shack up before you get married. It is not. That is not God's plan. Amen or oh me? I'm a preacher who's always going to tell you the truth. So here's Joseph. He knows he's sexually pure. About two, three months out of their wedding date, all of a sudden, Mary, Joseph, I'm pregnant. I'm just painting you a picture here so you get the full. Now, don't you know Joseph was some kind of confused? He's like, wait a minute, you tell me you love me? We have a legal binding engagement going on here. I know I haven't touched you, and you're telling me you're, you're pregnant. But the crazy thing is you're telling me you're still a virgin. How nuts is this, Mary? Do you hear yourself? But because Joseph was a man of character and a man of integrity... He wanted to put her away privately. In other words, he was going to break up with her in secret. He wasn't going to go on his Facebook page and start blasting her. Some of you need to learn that lesson. The only reason you're blasting anybody is to make yourself look good and them look bad. Stop doing that. Be a person of character. Be a person of integrity and just leave it alone. That is not on my outline. The Lord just told me to tell you that. So whoever needs it, there you go. Joseph was determined to just do this quietly. And in a couple of months when people said, Where's Mary? I hadn't seen you all together lately. Oh, things just didn't work out. Now that was the plan. Let's read on. Hey, y'all get the picture now? I like to give you pictures. Verse 20, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Whew. 
Here's Joseph fixing a breakup with Mary, and an angel shows up. Now, that'll get your attention. Verse 22, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Who's that prophet? Isaiah. We just read it. Here's the New Testament confirming the Old Testament right here. Verse 23, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Let me tell you something. If Jesus was not born of a virgin, if Mary was not a virgin, then the entire Bible's a lie. The Old Testament is a lie. The New Testament is a lie. But I'm thankful that it confirms itself hundreds and hundreds of years apart. The two writers did not know each other. It confirms that Jesus, in fact, was born of a virgin, just as the prophecy said it was. So, let's think about this for a moment. We celebrate Christmas every single year. December 25th is the day that was decided to celebrate as Christmas. Now, I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, I love Christmas. I do. I like I like. Uh, uh, the clothes that people wear, my favorite color is red, period. So I love it. I love the, uh, uh, the music. The music is one of my favorite. I am a Christmas music nut. I discipline myself till after Thanksgiving to start it, but I, I love it. I love the decorations. I love going and driving around looking at lights. I enjoy that. Susan and I, every few years ago, over and walked through Gulfport, uh, harbor over there. Beautiful display of lights over there. We thoroughly enjoy it. I love the lights. I love everything about it. And what I found out in general, the month of December, people are usually pretty nice to each other. All bets are off on the 26th of December, but you know, for the most part, the first part of December, people are nice to each other. Even the kids are nice to the parents until December 26th. You know. And y'all know why. You get it. You get it. Look, I know there's some people out there who say we shouldn't do all of this stuff. We shouldn't decorate. We shouldn't give gifts. We shouldn't listen to Christmas music. I've heard everything you can imagine. Because we should keep Christmas about Christ. I don't disagree with the let's keep Christmas about Christ. The sad part is that's the only day some people acknowledge Christ. We ought to be acknowledging him every single day. 365 days a year, not just at Christmas. Are you with me? Shout amen. amen. Is Christmas about Christ? Yes, it is. But so is December 26th. So is February 13th. So is March the 9th. You fill in the blanks. It's all about Jesus. For in Him we live and breathe and have our very existence. So we should acknowledge Him Every single day. There's a really cool thing that I love. When you study the Bible, Jesus is in every single book of the Bible. Every one of them. Now you might say, no he's not. I haven't read that. Or you've been reading it wrong. You've been reading it wrong. See, the Old Testament is filled with what we call types. A type of Christ. In other words, let me give you an example really fast. Did you know that Noah and the ark and the flood is a type of Christ? The flood represents sin, and those who were caught in the flood paid the price. Their judgment came because they chose not to believe. The ark, those who believed the word of the Lord and got inside of the ark, those eight people. They were inside the ark. That's a type of Christ. Those who are in Christ are safe from the judgment. Do you realize that that's a type of Christ? Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything. All the sacrifices, everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. That's what it was all about. It's designed to lead us right to the very King of kings and the Lord of lords. So every day should be about Jesus. 
Look, some of you may have seen this before. I've never used it in a sermon, and I, I, I wanted to use it this year. I want to show you Jesus in every book of the Bible, every one of them, all 66. Here we go. In Genesis, Jesus is the Word of God creating the heavens and the earth. He is the promised seed of the woman. In Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, Jesus is the high priest and the representative of the tabernacle. He is the lampstand. He is the showbread. He is the sacrifice on the altar. Numbers, Jesus is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and the smitten rock that gives living water. In Deuteronomy, Jesus is the prophet greater than Moses. In Joshua, Jesus is the commander of the army of the Lord, leading his people into the promised land. In Judges, Jesus is the true and final judge. In Ruth, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, Jesus is the anointed shepherd king who slays the giant. In First and Second Kings, Jesus is the righteous king of kings and lord of lords. In First and Second Chronicles, Jesus is the faithful restorer of the kingdom. In Ezra, Jesus is the faithful restorer of the temple. In Nehemiah, Jesus is the redeeming rebuilder of the walls. In Esther, Jesus is the sovereign protector of his people. In Job, Jesus is the living redeemer and our true comforter. In Psalms, Jesus is the good shepherd who hears our cries. In Proverbs, Jesus is wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, Jesus is the meaning of life. In the Song of Solomon, Jesus is the loving bridegroom coming for his bride. In Isaiah, Jesus is the promised Messiah, the wonderful counselor mighty God, everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, the suffering servant wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities. In Jeremiah, Jesus is the potter and the righteous branch. In Lamentations, Jesus is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, Jesus is the river of life bringing healing to the nations. In Daniel, Jesus is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, Jesus is the ever faithful husband pursuing an unfaithful bride. In Joel, Jesus is the restorer of what the locusts have eaten and the one who will pour his spirit on his people. In Amos, Jesus is the burden bearer and the true restoration. In Obadiah, Jesus is the true judge of all the earth and mighty to save. In Jonah, Jesus is salvation of all lands and the prophet cast out into the storm who spent three days in the depths. In Micah, Jesus is the promised Messiah born in Bethlehem. In Nahum, Jesus is the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, Jesus is the reason for rejoicing and our strength even when the fields are empty. In Zephaniah, Jesus is the preserver and restorer of his remnant and kingdom. In Haggai, Jesus is the desire of all nations. In Zechariah, Jesus is the cleansing fountain and the pierced sun whom every eye on earth will one day behold. In Malachi, Jesus is the son of righteousness rising with healing healing in his wings. He is the refiner's fire in Matthew. Jesus is the king of the Jews in Mark. Jesus is the servant king in Luke. Jesus is the son of man. In John, Jesus is the son of God, the word made flesh who dwelt among us and the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Acts, Jesus is the risen Lord bringing salvation to all nations. In Romans, Jesus is our justification and the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, Jesus is our rock. In 2 Corinthians, Jesus Jesus is our triumph, sanctifying his church. In Galatians, Jesus is the liberation that fulfills the law and sets us free. In Ephesians, Jesus is the head of the church who gives us God's armor. In Philippians, Jesus is our joy. In Colossians, Jesus is the firstborn of all creation and the head of the church. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus is coming again with a trumpet and a shout to meet believers in the air. In 2 Thessalonians, Jesus is believers' patience as they await his return. In 1 Timothy, Jesus is our mediator between God and man. In 2 Timothy, Jesus is the seed of David raised from the dead and our salvation. In Titus, Jesus is our blessed hope and our faithful pastor. In Philemon, Jesus is our Redeemer, restoring us to effective service. In Hebrews, Jesus is our high priest and author and finisher of our faith. In James, Jesus is the one at work in our faith and in action. In 1 Peter, Jesus is the living stone, the chief cornerstone, and the rock of offense. In 2 Peter, Jesus is the faithful, long-suffering Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. In 1 John, Jesus is love and the true and eternal 
child of God. In 2 John, Jesus is the truth by which we walk in love. In 3 John, Jesus is all that is good and a hospitable host. In Jude, Jesus is the one who keeps us from stumbling and presents us blameless with great joy. And in Revelation, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, and our soon returning King of kings and Lord of lords. That's our Jesus. That's who he is. That's who we celebrate every single day. Don't forget it. Don't be misled. You see, every day should be about Jesus.